Well, Mr. President, thank you for the time. It's a good, good to see you again. You are in New York. President Trump is in New York. Will you meet? There is no such program for a meeting. Mr. Trump did not create conditions necessary to bring about the atmosphere conducive to a meeting. He has expressed a willingness to meet with you. Has anyone reached out to you, to your office, on his behalf to try to arrange a meeting while you were both in New York? Naturally, if someone is keen on having a meeting and holding dialogue and creating progress in relationships, that person would not use the tool of sanctions and threats when a government brings to bear all of its power against another government and nation. That means that the necessary willpower is absent in order to resolve outstanding issues. So what are the conditions to resolve some of the issues you talk about that would allow you to meet? What would you like the United States to do as a first step to open up the opportunity for dialogue? In my opinion, the United States of America, that same bridge that left behind and demolished with its exit and violation of the JCPOA and the language of threats, that bridge must be rebuilt in order for both countries to be able to set programs for such conducive atmosphere and for their mutual futures. As you note, the United States has withdrawn from the, from the nuclear deal. The other countries are still officially in the accord. Why are you still in the agreement? Why have you not now left, given the U.S. exit? Well, the United States of America was hoping that with its violation of the JCPOA, we would naturally exit the JCPOA as well so that the case could be referred to the United Nations Security Council and via the United Nations, Iran could be brought under sanctions again. However, the planning and the vision of Mr. Trump failed to materialize against the norms. He violated the JCPOA and exited the JCPOA, turned the American government's back on UN Security Council Resolution 2231, and in reality trampled upon a resolution of the United Nations. Until such time that our interests are Guaranteed, with the five remaining countries, we will remain within the JCPOA. That means you will adhere to the limits on uranium production, but what would happen if those other countries are not able to live up to the terms? Is Iran prepared to go forward with its nuclear program? Well, a one-sided agreement would be meaningless if uh, an agreement up under which we would accept the limitations, we would also need to benefit from accepting certain limitations. So our remaining within the framework of the JCPOA would necessitate and would mean that the five remaining countries would need to adhere to their commitments and duties as well. How much are the sanctions that have already been reimposed, how much are they hurting your country? And in what ways are they affecting your country? Sanctions has brought pressure upon the people of our nation. And at the same time, it has made our exports, uh, it has augmented our exports, and our national production has seen a positive forward movement under these sanctions. The United States of America has brought all of its efforts to bear in order to trample upon all the norms and regulations of international trade. It has had the aim of bringing other countries, companies and firms under pressure against international laws in order for them to cease their relationships with Iranian partners and entities. So there is a uh, duel, if you will, between Mr. Trump and those who seek stability and security and cooperation 
cooperation in the region. All other countries in our region, with the exception of a couple of them, as well as worldwide, do not accept or approve of Mr. Trump's behavior and do believe that the JCPOA benefits the region as well as the international community worldwide as a whole. So it is an international effort. It is not just an Iranian effort. Many countries, the greatest majority of countries, accept our positions and approve of our positions. And we are hopeful that ultimately we will put this behind us. And ultimately the United States will realize that on this path that it has chosen, it is alone. And from a legal standpoint, a diplomatic standpoint, the, stand, uh, the standard of proper comportment, it has done everything erroneously vis-a-vis -vis this issue, and it has not benefited ultimately. When you speak to the U.N. this week, will you try and further drive this wedge between the U.S. and its, its European allies over this issue? Do you think you'll have a sympathetic ear from some of those other countries? Well, the European partners and the American allies, in other words, in Europe, have announced openly that they oppose Mr. Trump's actions. They have announced openly and clearly that they wish to remain within the framework of the JCPOA and have encouraged us to remain within the JCPOA. In other words, in the very uh, in the first few days when Mr. Trump exited this agreement, one of the European leaders held a telephone conversation with me and requested of me to give the necessary time to the Europeans in order for them to be able to take the appropriate steps and measures in order to safeguard this agreement. What I see is the will of the five remaining countries and that of the European Union for the JCPOA to be preserved and maintained. We are not the ones seeking to increase a gap between America and others. It has been the inappropriate behavior of Mr. Trump that has created this chasm. And if this inappropriate behavior continues, then the gaps will only increase. The secondary round of sanctions is scheduled to begin in November. The U.S. has made it clear that it wants to bring your oil exports down to zero. Do you think that will happen, and how will you respond if it does? First of all, the United States of America in action has already done what will take place supposedly in November. In this very month of September, it has brought tremendous pressure on many countries, those who are, are crude petroleum customers and purchasers. So the appearance is that November is still uh, some weeks away. But in the month of September, what was scheduled for the United States to do is taking place, what it was scheduled to be done in November. So the United States is not capable of bringing our oil exports to zero. This is an empty promise, uh, and it's a threat that is empty of credibility. Perhaps on this path we will sustain certain pressures, but certainly the United States will not reach its objective. Some of the statements from Iranian officials have given the impression that Iran might move to shut down the, the Strait of Hormuz to block all exports from the Persian Gulf. Is that something that you would consider? If the United States wishes to use force in order to sanction the petroleum industry of Iran, it will certainly see the appropriate response. We do have the power to secure our own waterways and keep our waterways free. And during the past many centuries, it has been Iran that has had an effective role in securing the safety and security of the waterways in the Persian Gulf, the Strait of Hormuz, and the Sea of Oman. And we will continue this role in the future. Is that a warning to the Trump administration? Should they take that as a warning? This is not a warning. This is a reality. If the Persian Gulf waterway, which is to remain free and secure, it must remain so for everyone. The U.S. released its annual terror report recently, and it found Iran was one of the worst offenders of supporters of terrorism. How do you respond to their continued complaints and concerns about your support, Iran's support for, 
for Hamas and Hezbollah. I do believe that Saturday's event in Ahvaz clearly responds to these U.S. allegations. The United States, only in words, says that she's against terrorism, but in actions it is not so. Countries, governments in our region who support terrorism, terrorism that is against the Iranian nation, terrorism that is against the Syrian nation or the Iraqi nation or Yemen, these countries have very tight relations and close relations with the United States of America. And I ask you, all of the bombs falling on the Yemeni people that are being used against them on a daily basis, where do they come from? The airplanes that carry the ordinance that target Yemeni people, where do they come from? The weapons and weapon systems found in the hands of Daesh or ISIS in Iraq and Syria, many of them were U.S. manufactured and made. So only in words they express as being against terrorism, but in action, unfortunately, we see that they do support terrorists. This double standard must be set aside by the United States of America. If we see terrorism as a danger for world stability and world peace, which indeed it is so, then all of us must correctly and straightforwardly combat terrorism. The United States of America names those who are today fighting ISIS in Iraq and Syria as terrorists. If Daesh or ISIS is a terrorist group, then what do we make of those who are fighting against ISIS or Daesh? Then you cannot name them both terrorists. The terrorists as well as those that are fighting against them are both terrorists? It cannot be so, not in Syria, not in any country. So there is a gap between the comportment and the expressions of the United States of America. So let me be clear here. Do you think the United States supported the groups that, that launched the attack in Abbas that killed dozens of of people? Uh, the United States of America yesterday, one of the American officials clearly and openly supported these terrorists, said that in Ahvaz, if something took place, Iran must not seek the roots of that terrorist attack in other countries. It brings to bear the, the comportment of the Iranian government. So in other words, what they're saying is that the United States of America justifies terrorist activity and supports such activity and sees the cause of this activity as the government of Iran. If this is indeed so, if this train of thought makes sense, how do we apply the same logic to the terrorist attacks of September 11th? How would we view it? How would we view the terrorist attacks perpetrated on Paris, on Brussels? So in other words, the terrorists are innocent and the governments are guilty and the terrorists are fighting for their own objectives and the governments are guilty of not capitulating to them. Yesterday, in the United Nations, it was clearly announced that the United, that the Islamic Republic of Iran must surrender to these terrorists, and this was quite an embarrassment for them. Iran's support of terrorism is one of the views of the United States, the reason, the justification for getting out of the nuclear deal. Another one was Iran's continued development of ballistic missiles, missiles that ultimately could carry nuclear warheads. In a different world, if, if you're able to get past the, the, the nuclear deal as it was, is Iran willing to renegotiate that deal and open it up to issues like terrorism, like ballistic missiles? The United States government is not truthful. It is not against nuclear weapons. The very first and the very last and the only government that thus far has used nuclear weapons against innocent civilians has been the United States of America, used against the people of Japan. No other country has done so. It supports a country, that of Israel, that does possess dangerous nuclear warheads. So they're really not against nuclear weapons. They are against a good agreement, the continuation of a good agreement known as the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Actions. Now, when we talk about Iran's weapon systems, they're 
solely for defensive purposes. As you know, thus far, we have used the missiles that we develop ourselves against, on two occasions, against terrorist targets on both occasions. When Daesh or ISIS perpetrated a terrorist attack on our parliament in the Iranian capital, we hit two of their camps with missiles. And when a number of them attacked a number of our cities in the Iranian Kurdish region, we hit their camps and training sites with our missiles. So they are for defensive purposes and they target terrorists. And we have done that and we will do so in the future for targeting terrorism that perpetrates against us and our, for our country's own defense. Mr. President, you and all of us witnessed the United States President, President Trump, uh, travel to Singapore and sit down with Kim Jong-un, a country that does have nuclear weapons. I, I'm curious how you view that meeting and if there is somewhere a model in there that, that might broach an opening for dialogue between Iran and the United States. The North Korean model cannot be a correct model because we cannot draw such comparisons. But certainly there are different models out there that can be used, parts of which can be used in order to decrease tensions between Iran and the United States. This is in the hands of the Trump administration for it to cease its threatening behavior towards Iran and to return to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Given what happened in the JCPOA, do you think the U.S. can be, would you advise other countries about trusting the U.S. with regard to, to treaties and accords? In my opinion, the Americans, when it comes to multilateral international agreements and accords, they have left quite a, a few behind and exited many. Uh, the Paris Climate Accord, NAFTA, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and the JCPOA. Uh, in my opinion, trampling upon agreements and accords without viable reasons will not benefit the Americans in the long term. America will lose its benefits when it comes to the steps that they took in fighting international accords and agreements. I think the United States of America must return to its international agreements and return to the agreements in conjunction with which United Nations resolutions were passed. This will benefit not only the international community, the world as a whole, but also and mainly the United States of America. I know you don't like to get into domestic American domestic policy, but I, I do have to ask you about President Trump. He faces legal challenges. He faces, according to reports, challenges from within his own inner circle, within his administration. Do you see that as an opportunity for Iran to, to buy time, to have a little more space to deal with, with sanctions as, as you watch what happens here? Well, because we see all of these actions taken against international laws, the U.S. imposed sanctions, we see those as against international laws because under Security Council Resolutions 2231, which says to all countries that they must support the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. So based on that, what the United States of America has done is against international law, and the sanctions are also against international laws. Of course, of course we wish for these sanctions to be defeated. Of course, we wish for the U.S. comportment, which is illegal, to be unsuccessful. And of course, we wish for the United States to cease its current activities because we see a cessation of all of these to the benefit of the region and the world as a whole. I'm curious about the Iranian people. They, they had a lot of hope in the nuclear agreement that it would open up a lot of things. Now sanctions are being reimposed. How does that expose you politically in terms of what, what the people expected and the reality of what is happening now? 
خب مردم واقعیتشون منطبق بود well, در چارچوب the people's expectations were directly correspondent to what was contained in the international agreement the expectation and our promise to our people was to hold a dialogue and a negotiation with six countries and reach an ultimate resolution it took over 30 months of negotiations for these negotiations to yield results after we reached the results and the international in other words when we're talking about the UN Security Council resolution uh, sanctions when they were lifted of course our people were happy and their hope was that based on the joint comprehensive plan of action all signatories will remain faithful and committed but unfortunately the Americans from the very beginning failed to keep their commitments and the Trump administration left the framework of this agreement. So the expectation of our people was not for such countries as the United States of America to sign such an accord and then to leave it with such comfort and nonchalantly. So, quite frankly, this is not a success. This is a decrease in America's position in the thoughts and opinions of other countries. But ultimately, it is the hope of the Iranian people that is tied to the domestic reliance of Iran. And even though the exiting of the United States from the JCPOA does create problems, I do believe that we can leave this behind, overcome these challenges, because today in our country, in result of these very sanctions, we have seen many positive results as well. For example, our non-oil related exports have increased. In many fields, our domestic production has seen a better start than in the past. But clearly the, the current situation cannot benefit either country. So how do we move out of this, Mr. President? What, do, what, is the, what is the mechanism to begin some sort of dialogue to get past this? I do believe that the current situation, I agree with you, does not benefit the United States nor Iran nor other countries. Today, when some international firms under pressure of the United States of America are forced to leave Iran. They do not do so gladly and they are quite upset by it. So it's not just the benefits of the United States of America or Iran, it's the benefits of many countries involved. We're talking about stability, we're talking about security and peace, we're talking about trusting one another. So the keys to such a thing is firmly in the hands of the United States of America's government. It must return to the agreement so that we can continue on the previous path so that we can all reach, reach more benefits. I want to ask you about Syria, and uh, I want to ask you what Iran's end game is in Syria. How does this end? In my opinion, the trend in Syria in the past few months and in the past few years has been a good one. The terrorist groups have suffered continuous defeats. Many of the cities throughout Syria have been freed from the hands of terrorists. The capital of Syria, Damascus, today is much more secure and safe than at any time in the past few years. So the terrorists have lost much territory and currently hold very little territory. More than 90% of the Syrian territory is under control of the Syrian government. So the cooperation between Iran, Turkey and Russia has been quite effective. This cooperation has been very effective thus far and very positive for Syria. And our efforts are on creating a cooperation and a dialogue between the government of Syria and the opposition groups based upon which a new constitution can be written based upon which then elections can be held that will determine the future Syrian government so our future expectations for Syria is increased freedom reconstruction democracy and the repatriation of those that were driven from their homes if Assad is ultimately successful does Iran exit? At what point does Iran withdraw from Syria? Our presence in Syria has only to do with the will of the Syrian government. From the very beginning when we entered Syria was based upon the invitation of the Syrian government based upon which we sent our military advisors there. 
and our fight was focused against terrorists. Whenever terrorists are defeated in Syria and terrorism ceases to exist in Syria and the government of Syria has no need for us, then at that point our continued presence in Syria will not have any meaning or serve any purpose. Mr. President, you've been very gracious with your time. It's always good to talk to you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Hey, NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.